Hey, welcome to Return of the King. This is our series where we're going through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter to see what the Bible really has to say about the end of the world. Uh, in this study, we are trying to get away from what speculation and systems have to say. And we want to get into what Revelation, uh, speaking generally of Revelation, and what Scripture has to say. Hey, thanks so much for joining. This is a, an incredible chapter today as we are in Revelation chapter 11. And we're looking at this interesting event where John is given a task to measure the temple. And this is a, a, a really challenging chapter to understand and interpret. In fact, one Bible commentator uh, referred to this as the swamp of the book of Revelation. Uh, quite a description there. But many of the Bible commentaries, when you get to this particular chapter, will indicate just how notoriously difficult it is to interpret uh, this particular chapter. So I'm glad you're with us. And let's see if we can uh, wade through the waters a little bit without getting all bogged down and see what we can find out about this. This is actually the second part uh, that we have done in uh, Revelation chapter 11. We've already looked at the two witnesses. So if you haven't seen that episode, you can find that right up here and uh, hope that you'll join us for that one. Uh, what we're going to be covering today in these just two short verses is what does measuring mean in the Bible? Uh, this is a significant task that John is given to do, uh, but there's actually other examples, and we're going to take a look at what some of those other examples might reveal about what's happening right here. And then we're also going to look at what is the significance of the temple, because this can be one of those overlooked aspects of what is actually going on here, and we don't want to miss out on that. So uh, before we really get into this, I'm kind of curious. Uh, what do you think is the meaning of measuring in Revelation chapter 11? What have you been taught? What have you been told? What do you kind of understand? Or uh, if it's just, I have no idea, that's okay too. Leave that in the comments below. I'd love to hear. And then maybe your answer to this question of who or what is the temple? Uh, is this a literal building? Is it uh, a legitimate temple? Uh, or does it represent something else? Uh, stick around. Let's uh, see if we can figure out uh, where we land on this today. And you may disagree with me, but I hope, I hope uh, that this will at least give you something to think about along the way. And if it does help you out, maybe it does answer some questions that you have, or uh, maybe at least just gives you something new to think about in a different way uh, about the book of Revelation and Revelation 11, in uh, chapter 11 in particular. Hope you'll give me a like, uh, kind of lets YouTube know that, hey, this is worthy uh, to be looked at and uh, maybe some helpful information out there. And if you'd like to follow out on our other uh, um, uh, episodes in this series, hope you'll subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell. Every week we're dropping a new episode, sometimes twice a week, depending on how ministry allows me the time to do this. And by all means, please uh, leave your questions and comments down below. I'm fascinated uh, by the insight and comments that people have. Uh, some of them are really good and some of them are kind of out there to be quite honest. Uh, but I, I love to hear from you. It's been just an incredible journey to go through this. And certainly if you have any legitimate questions, please leave those in the comments below and I will do my very best uh, to answer those for you as best as I can. So let's dive right in now. Let's look at uh, these two verses of measuring the temple. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, but you can follow along with uh, whatever translation uh, you have uh, or just follow right here with me. So Revelation 11, starting in verse 1, says, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So kind of the setup then where we are going to see the two witnesses that flow out of this in just a moment, how they will be preaching um, in uh, the in Jerusalem, perhaps. And uh, certainly it's kind of an indication that that's where they're going to be killed. So for more on that, make sure you watch that video. Uh, but this is part of that uh, two-chapter interlude that we see between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. In the first part of the interlude, John is encountering this mighty angel, and he is told to eat this little book. You can find that in uh, this episode here for more information on that. And what we basically see, spoiler alert, that is that eating the book and that whole purpose there is to uh, recommission John for this prophetic purpose of telling about the events that are going to be happening. And one message in particular that the angel announces is that with the seventh trumpet, 
that's when judgment comes. And so that's a pretty potent kind of thing. And this is now kind of flowing out of that first part. He's been given that, uh, that new commission or recommission uh, for that prophetic call. And now he's going to be given a task. Uh, so this is uh, John's prophetic task that he is given to do here. Up until this point in the book of Revelation, in these first 10 uh, chapters, John has only been an observer. He's only been seeing and recording uh, these events that they've been playing out before uh, him. This is the first time that he's actually given a, a, a real task to do. Now, it may be the second if you count eating the little book in Revelation chapter 10 as a task to do, uh, but this seems to be really kind of the, the first real task with a prophetic sort of meaning to it. Uh, and so what John is told to do, his task is to measure the temple, measure the altar, and those who worship there. So there's three things that John is supposed to be measuring. But he's also told uh, that he is to exclude the outer court. So the part of this that he's not supposed to measure is the outer court. Uh, so he has a threefold task of things to measure, the one part uh, to not uh, measure. And so the first big interpretive question here is, what is the significance of measuring the temple? What does measuring mean? Uh, why is he given this particular task? Well, good news is uh, we have some Old Testament examples of measuring. Uh, we see in Zechariah chapter 1 and 2, Lamentations chapter 2, and Ezekiel chapter 40. And then again, also in Revelation chapter one, uh, 21, that's where we'll see uh, the, uh, the new Jerusalem coming down, and there's a measurement that is given of that. So we have at least four examples of measurement. Three have already taken place. So let's dig into that a little bit because this is one of those times where we rely very heavily on the Old Testament. 70% of the book of Revelation is Old Testament allusions. Uh, so this means that there's a lot of Old Testament influence in the book of Revelation. And oftentimes, in order to understand the book of Revelation, we need to go back and take a look at what the significance uh, is of the Old Testament passage that it's referring to. And there is no exception here, except we have three different examples, and all of them mean something different. And this is why this is part of the reason this is a difficult chapter uh, to interpret because we have three different meanings that could be the possibility of measuring. This is not a one-for-one one where we can simply go back and say, oh, this is what measuring means because there was one example and this is what measuring meant. In fact, measurements can mean something radically different. So let's take a look here um, at the different purposes of uh, measuring in the Old Testament. So Zechariah chapter 2, verse 1, uh, here's where he's recording that he sees this man really an angel uh, with a measuring line in his hand. And he said, where are you going? And he said to me to measure Jerusalem to see what it's width and what it's length. Um, and so what we're seeing in uh, Zechariah is uh, the, more the idea that measuring means restoration and rebuilding. So look at Zechariah 1.16. Therefore, thus says Lord God, I have returned to Jerusalem with my mercy. My house shall be built, and it declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. So this is what we see as the intent of this measuring. So that man with the measuring line that we just encountered in chapter 2 is the fulfillment of this. Now remember the context of this. This is at the end of that 70-year exile that the people of Israel had been taken away into the land of Babylon, and they're beginning to come back. The rebuilding of Jerusalem has begun, but the work on the temple has stalled. And so God uses Zechariah and Haggai uh, in particular to speak to the, people, uh, to the people to stir up and spur on the rebuilding. And so here's this prophetic promise that God is actually for this project. He is behind this. He is supporting this. And so they can have the confidence to move forward with this project. And so in this case, Measuring is very much like today when we see somebody going out to survey a plot of land for a house or a building or something like that. There's some op optimism, some future hope that on that piece of ground, a new building will emerge out of that. And that's what uh, the message of hope here is in Zechariah. So measuring is that idea of restoration and rebuilding. But we also see just a few years before this, measuring was used to indicate judgment and destruction. Lamentations 2.8, written by Jeremiah the prophet, who was there at the beginning of the Babylonian exile, when the Babylonians came in, burned the city, uh, burned the city destroyed the temple in 586 uh, BC. 
and uh, Jeremiah walks through the ruins of the city, and this is what he writes, that that heart-wrenching book of lamentation as he describes in de great detail the wrath of God and the judgment of God that came on uh, uh, the people of Judah and on J Jerusalem in particular uh, during that time. And he writes, the Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. He stretched out the measuring line. He did not re restrain his hand from destroying. So in this case, it's the total opposite meaning. Remember in Zechariah, it's rebuilding, there's hope. In this case, it's judgment and destruction. So we don't have just a clear one-to-one -one that we can say, oh, measuring means this, because here we have just two examples and two extremes of what measuring could mean. And here's the third, and this is uh, now in Zechariah. Again, I think this is another aspect of what we're seeing that uh, measuring can mean. Uh, it says, and I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will be in the uh, glory of her midst. So in this case, that wall of fire is intended to, to show presence and preservation, uh, that God will be among them, that God will be protecting and preserving them. And so here is again, another message of hope that comes from measuring. So what does it mean in Revelation chapter 11? Uh, so again, let's take a look. He's told to measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out for it is given over to the nations. And then we're going to hear uh, the big clue in this, because it is given over to the nations uh, for given over, uh, I'm sorry about that. I got that uh, duplicated there. And they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So the big uh, uh, clue in this is that the unmeasured part is going to be trampled. It's going to be destroyed. And so that gives us more the indication of what the measured part indicates. And so what does it mean in Revelation 11? I think it means protection. I think that the measuring here, that the temple of God, the altar of God, and the, those who worship there are being shown to be under the protection of God. Those outside of that measurement will be trampled, but those inside that measurement are the ones who have that divine protection. Hey, by the way, just a reminder, uh, if you haven't, go ahead and give this a thumbs up, particularly if this has given you some good things to think about. I just really appreciate it. that's the greatest thanks you can give, and I, I'm grateful for that. But let's move on. Um, second big interpretive question then uh, is, is the temple here real or symbolic? So hang on with me if this is kind of new for you or is kind of rubbing on edge, and let's take a look at kind of the pros and cons of these different views. So there are actually about three different categories of views, and one is uh, what some people call the heavenly view. Uh, they see that uh, John is commanded to measure the temple in heaven. Now, if you're like me, there's a great big question that comes to mind because he's also told not to measure the outer court because it's being left to be trampled by the nation. So my problem with this is, how did the wicked trample a portion of a temple in heaven? So this one really doesn't have uh, a real strong viewpoint. Uh, if you hold to this particular view and you've got a good rationale for that, uh, let me know. I, I'm kind of curious, but for me, uh, this is kind of a problematic view. Um, second is what is the known as the literal view, that John was measuring a real, literal, physical temple. And this is actually going to be broken up into two different camps. Uh, there is one camp that sees this as a future te temple, and one camp that sees this as the, te the second temple that was destroyed in 70 AD. The futurist would see this as the third temple that will be rebuilt in the last days. So this is that Ezekiel temple from Ezekiel chapter 40 and following uh, that will uh, one day be rebuilt. And so this is uh, what the futurists are looking at as this is the temple that John is measuring. Uh, the preterists, which see that the events of the book of Revelation uh, are, were actually fulfilled in 70 AD. So they see an early date to the writing of the book of Revelation. They think that John uh, received this revelation around uh, 60 to 65 uh, AD, um, and that all of this uh, took place by the destruction, and it's actually uh, foretelling the destruction of the temple and the destruction of uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Romans. And so they see this as... Uh, uh, a literal temple that was there when John was writing this. And so somehow he is maybe teleported over uh, to do this, or in the vision, he is seeing this particular temple and he uh, does this. So 
Uh, let's take a look at the case for the, the literal view. Uh, one is, well, John seems to have had an actual temple to, to measure, and that would kind of be the plain reading of the text. And preterism in particular would say, uh, not only is it um, a real temple, but it's the temple that was standing uh, in the days of Jesus. Uh, the second uh, rationale for the literal view is that the Ezekiel 40 through 42 temple has not yet been built. Uh, the dimensions are vastly different from the Zerubbabel uh, temple, the one that Zechariah was urging that they get to busy on, get working, why are you slacking kind of thing, uh, that Herod the, uh, the Great later added on to. So Zerubbabel started the temple. Herod uh, the Great, to kind of curry the favor with the Jews, did this massive rebuilding project. And ironically, uh, it was finished, uh, the building project, in 64 AD. And just six years later, uh, the Romans absolutely uh, leveled it. Um, so such to the point that even today, can't even really tell where the Holy of Holies was. Uh, that That's a lot. The third thing is that, that we have this very clear prophecy in 2 Thessalonians 2.4 that predicts that the man of lawlessness, uh, you may better understand him as the Antichrist or the beast of Revelation 13. And this is what the prophecy actually says is that uh, he opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes a seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So it would appear that there needs to be a temple for the Antichrist to appear in and make this kind of self-deifying proclamation. Uh, so there are some compelling elements to the case for the literal view, but there's also some weaknesses. And this is what I uh, want to just take a little bit of time to go through. So particularly to my preterist friends uh, who think that, well, obviously John is measuring the temple that was standing in his day. Keep in mind, we have precedent in scripture for a measurement of a temple that wasn't there. And that's the Ezekiel 40 temple. At the time of Ezekiel's uh, prophecy, the temple had been leveled. The city was in absolute ruins uh, that all of the temple um, furniture and those uh, precious pieces like the menorah, uh, the candlestick, and all those kind of things had been carried away into Babylon. There was no literal temple standing when Ezekiel had his vision. So I don't know that uh, that's a real strong argument uh, if you're coming from the, the preterist camp or even if you're coming from the futurist camp that there had to be an actual temple there. He could have seen this in a vision. In fact, the whole book is a whole lot of visions and doesn't necessarily mean that there had to be something physical on earth at the time or even in a future time in order for him to have had that vision. Um, and secondly, there's a big, big question that rattles around in my head, and it's this, and it's not insignificant. Would a future rebuilt Jewish temple with Jewish sacrifices be legitimate in God's eyes? Now, remember in verse one, he is told to measure the temple of God. And yet I have a difficulty here because there's some implications to this. So, Here's the big caution for my futurist friends, uh, and, I, and I'm in the futurist camp uh, for sure, um, but for those who do see Ezekiel's temple being built in the near future, and you're looking at the efforts that are being made in Israel and other places to get all the things ready, and it may yet happen, but my question is, would it really be legitimate in God's eye? Would it be um, a, legitimate, a, excuse me, a legitimate place where legitimate sacrifices are being made that would have any kind of efficacy for the person. Meaning, would the sacrifice of an animal in that temple provide any covering, any forgiveness of sin at all? Would that be acceptable to God? I think that the rest of the New Testament excludes that possibility, particularly when we get into Hebrews 8 through 10. Uh, the whole book of Hebrews is about the new and better covenant. Uh, and I don't think that God is going to renege on the new covenant, this better covenant, to bring back an old and incomplete and flawed one. You just need to read through the, the book of Hebrews kind of carefully to see how Jesus is better. He's better than the angels. He is a better high priest uh, because he doesn't die. He doesn't have to offer sacrifices for his own sins, and he lives forever. Uh, he's, a, he's brought a better sacrifice. It's his blood, which is far, far better than the uh, blood of, of cattle and of sheep, and which cannot remove sin. And he is 
uh, the, 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 the bringer of a better covenant that can uh, uh, make the difference uh, for our lives. And so here's just a few passages that we see. And I, I would encourage you, if you're struggling with this, go back and read Hebrews 8 through 10 in particular. So here's just kind of some synopsis from a few different verses. But as it is, Christ has ob obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would no, have been no occasion to look for a second. What's being clearly admitted and revealed by scripture here is that there were the, the first covenant was not fault, faultless. It was not perfect. It could not do what we needed it to do. This is why we needed the new covenant, the better covenant, the better way, and that's Jesus. Hebrews 8.13 says, in speaking of the new covenant, he makes the first one, the old covenant, the Old Testament, the old system, obsolete. It's, it's null and void. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So at the writing of this, which was clearly before 70 AD, we're moving up to that time where the temple is going to absolutely be obliterated and the old covenant becomes completely obsolete vanish away, never to come back again. That's kind of like Confederate money. Uh, it might have had value at one time, but it will no longer ever have any value again. It will have no effect for anyone who tries to do the old covenant things because we have a new covenant with a new sacrifice that was given through Jesus. And look again here at, uh, at Hebrews chapter 10, 9 and 10. And then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. This is kind of Jesus speaking here. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This is such good news. And this is such the power of the sacrifice of Jesus that he does away with the first covenant. He brings about the new covenant. And this all came about through the sacrifice of Jesus. And this is a once for all sacrifice. His sacrifice is sufficient. You know, I remember as a kid one time coming home from uh, church, it was a beautiful Sunday. Uh, my dad and I were walking home. We didn't live all that far from church. And my dad is just a simple guy. He's um, not a great theologian or anything. Uh, but the pastor had been talking about the old covenant sacrificial system. And I said, dad, why don't we do sacrifices anymore? And, and his, his answer was really simple, profound, and utterly true. He said, because Jesus paid it all. And that's the reality, that his is the better blood offering. His is the better sacrifice. And to signify that, remember, at the moment of his death, the, 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 uh, the, the curtain in the, the temple that separated the most holy place from the holy place was torn in two from the top to the bottom. I don't see any evidence anywhere in scripture that God is going to sew, metaphorically speaking, that curtain back up. Uh, Christ has once for all entered that sanctuary with the better offering, his blood, and anything else would be inferior. In fact, if there is a new temple with legitimate old sacrifices, meaning that somehow or another animal sacrifices would be a, an alternate way that people could sacrifice and find uh, covering for their sin, then the sacrifice of Jesus is pointless. And it really cheapens what Jesus has done. Uh, that's the message of Hebrews. This is why we don't have those old covenant sacrifices anymore. They are unnecessary. And to try to bring those back in again is an insult to the blood of Jesus. It cheapens the blood of Jesus, and it would make us wonder, why did God have Jesus die at all if there were any other way? We see that necessity of the blood sacrifice of Jesus. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why? Because there was no other way. He is the only way, and animals can't do it. It had to be the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, now, some people will say, well, no, 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 it's not going to be those kind of sacrifices. It'll be a legitimate temple, but they'll just be doing memorial sacrifices. Well, the book of Hebrews really kind of undercuts that 
argument as well. Number one, uh, in Hebrews, it says sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. He is our once for all offering. And Jesus has already given us the memorial. Uh, the memorial sacrifice, if you will, is the Lord's Supper. It's communion. This is what Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. It is first and foremost, a memorial meal. This is the way that God has given us, that Jesus has given us to memorialize the death, not animal sacrifices. This is one of the two ordinances of the church, or maybe in your tradition, you call this the, the sacra, uh, sacrament. In, in my tradition, we call it ordinances because this is a command of Jesus. He did not give us a command to do any kind of animal sacrifices. And so I, I, I hesitate a little bit with this idea of a new temple being built that will somehow be a legitimate temple. Uh, and so that kind of brings us back around um, to, well, what is another option? And I think this is where I would tend to land, and many, many people, I'm not alone in this, uh, that this, this is the symbolic view, that the temple here in Revelation chapter 11, and folks, let me, let me say, I'm not saying that there may not be a temple built. Uh, we do see that 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. What I'm saying is that this temple here, the temple of God in Revelation 11, is not that temple. Uh, because I don't see a true temple being built that has legitimate sacrifices that will be a substitute or a memorial for the death of Jesus. I, I, I just don't see that. Now, if I'm wrong, you can let me know. Uh, this is probably where I'm blowing up the comments, and that's okay. I can take that, uh, because like a lot of Revelation, there are things that are hard to understand. What I'm trying to do is not interject uh, just simply a nearsighted view of this uh, and just kind of picking from Scripture. I'm trying to take the whole of Scripture into context, and I can't ignore the book of Hebrews, particularly Hebrews 8 through 10. So again, feel free to light up the comments. It's all right. Um, so my viewpoint and viewpoint of a lot of others is that this is the temple is really representative of God's people. We've seen a lot of symbolic uh, language and imagery pointing to all of the people of God. Now, there's a question here, and even in uh, the kind of camp that I land in with the symbolic view, there is still some... Um, differences of opinion of, is this all of God's people, Jewish and Gentile believers, which would be the church, or is it just simply referencing Jewish believers? I tend to think that it's both Jewish and Gentile believers, uh, but it could be just be the Jewish believer. Eldon Ladd is one of those uh, people who's kind of the forerunner of the historic pre-mill view in the recent uh, last century, so to speak. Um, and, and he tends to hold that this is symbolic, but it just represents the Jewish people. And so if you land there, that's okay. I'm not going to be mad at you. Uh, but I tend to land what this is really looking at all of God's people. And here's kind of the clue from the passage of why we would have the symbolic understanding. So again, that, uh, that passage, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Here's that key phrase. This is what is unique to this passage. In all the other measuring passages, even in Revelation chapter 21, it's about the building and the land. Uh, it's not about the people. This is a unique element here. And I think that uniqueness is kind of sent uh, there to message that, or to highlight the significance and the importance of what is really being talked about here. So I think the unique element to the passage is the focus, that it is the focus on the people, particularly God's people. And so uh, that's what we're seeing in this particular passage, that God is doing this measuring. He is measuring out his people for protection. Now, there's a little bit more to that, so hang on. Um, so the New Testament, and this is strong, the New Testament has already clearly redefined the temple as the body of Christ in two ways, two if you're in Europe. <laughs> um, so the, the first thing is that it's Jesus's physical body. We see that in John chapter 2, 19 through 21. We'll get there in a second. And then we also see that uh, the temple as the body of Christ, in other words, the church. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 2 Corinthians 6, 16. So the example of it being the physical body of Jesus, John chapter 2 is when he's having this confrontation with the Pharisees. And he says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So here Jesus is using that temple imagery, that temple language, 
to refer to his own physical body, which is a beautiful and powerful image that he gives us of the reality of who he is. As far as that imagery goes, and you probably already know this, uh, that the, the temple is the church, or the church is God's temple here and now. Um, and this is uh, what we see in 1 Corinthians uh, 3.16. We're also going to see that in 2 Corinthians 6.16, and then hugely in Ephesians 2.21 and following. Great passage, strongly suge suggests that you take a look at that at some point. Uh, but here it says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So he's speaking of the church to the church. And notice that you, it's in English, and English is kind of deficient uh, because we don't have a real clear distinction between singular and plural, but in the Greek, it is clearly plural. So if you're in the southern part of the United States that has fixed this problem uh, with English, it's do you not know that y'all, plural, are God's temple? You're welcome. That's the fix. Um, so. This is not thus saith the Lord, but this is thus saith the Randy. Uh, this interlude in chapters 10 and 11 is brought here. It's, it interrupts the flow of the sixth and seventh trumpet uh, by giving us confidence, giving believers confidence, understanding uh, that what is about to happen is that the nations are going to come against God's people in a very significant way. And there's going to be a lot of pain and persecution that comes through that. We see this particularly in Revelation 13. So when the beast comes, he is given the authority, uh, the power to conquer and to kill the saints, which are the followers of Jesus. So even though uh, we will have this strong opposition, we still have this preservation and power. And no matter how dark the coming days get, we are still prote uh, protected. Here's the cool thing. Basically what Revelation is revealing to us is they can kill you, but they can't hurt you. Let that sink in. They can kill you, but they can't harm you. It, it, this is a temporary situation that we're in, but ultimately when we see the martyrs and what happens to them, those who die for the name of Christ, that ultimately they may have suffered for a short amount of time in the duration of, etern of eternity, but they are not taken out of existence, that they get to exist forever without harm. The leaves of the nations in Revelation, uh, or the leaves of the tree are given for the healing of the nations. Uh, Revelation 22 tells us uh, that he will wipe away every tear, that we have this joy-filled existence that awaits us in the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. So even though this world may kill us, and the days may get dark for believers, they can't ultimately harm us. That's a cool thought. So here's some possible meaning and messaging of the measuring. So if this is indeed correct, and I again, I could be wrong, um, that God is measuring out his people, not a building, for divine protection. And that's the key. He's measuring the worshipers. It's not so much about the building, but the people. The outer court exclusion could mean at least in my understanding, one of two things. He is making a distinction between those who are truly his and those who simply profess that they're his, but they're not. So that could be one possibility where we have those that are truly in that temple complex and those that are not that have kind of been these posers. They show up to church. They pretend uh, to be Christians, but deep down, they have not been truly converted. They're not truly saved. Uh, they're just kind of religious. And that's part of what we see in that separation of the wheat and tares that Jesus talks about. The second uh, possibility is that God is indicating that some of his true people will be trampled. Uh, that they will be killed like we see in Revelation 13, 7, where the beast has given that authority to, to kill them, but not everyone. There is no, 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 nowhere, anywhere that indicates that every single Christian, every person of God will ever be killed. We have that hope of um, the their being living at the time of the resurrection. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will join them. So that's uh, the, the hope that we have there. So uh, that's my two cents on that. What do you think, uh, again, is the meaning of the measuring? Uh, wh where did I get it right? Uh, what's giving you something new to think about? And who or what is the, the temple? And again, uh, I hope that you'll drop me a like. If this has given you anything at all, if it's challenged your thinking, uh, leave me a comment and please subscribe. Most of all, thank you. Thank you so much for watching, taking your time with me. I greatly appreciate it. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time uh, when we talk about the third woe, the seventh trumpet. So uh, hang around for that and make sure you catch some of our other videos videos until that one drops. God bless. We'll see you next time.